A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. On leaving the synagogue, Jesus entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law lay sick with a fever. They immediately told him about her. He approached, grasped her hand, and helped her out. Then the fever left her, and she waited on them. When it was evening, after sunset, they brought him all who were ill or possessed by demons. The whole town gathered at the door. He cured many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons, not permitting them to speak because they knew him. Rising very early before dawn, he left and went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him and on finding him said, Everyone is looking for you. Jesus told them, Let us go unto the nearby villages that I may preach there also. For this purpose I have come. So he went into their synagogues, preaching and driving out demons throughout the whole region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Dear sisters and brothers, let me ask you a simple question. When was the last time you asked yourself or someone asked you the question, why me? In 1939, as the World War II began, the French Algerian author and Nobel Prize, Prize winner for literature, Albert Camus, wrote in his notebook, I quote, The reign of beasts has begun. End of quote. Perhaps, dear friends, Camus, beasts are still walking this earth in the form of dictators and tyrants, and tragedies have cluttered the human landscape since its inception, causing much pain and suffering in the world. Tragedies often unite people, communities, and even nations. While it is helpful to share another person's pain with another, yet when all is said and done, each person we know must confront his or her own pain. In order to do so, we need to be able to make sense of what often does not make any sense. The question we ask in the face of suffering and pain is, why me? Or why do bad things happen to good people, innocent people? Like Job in today's first reading, often it is a question, dear friends, that is put to God and has had many people to deny God and God's love. Even people of faith, while trying to look for intellectually satisfying answers to the question evil and suffering, tend to respond in different ways. 
if few of us share Job's innocence, I guess all of us share his hurt in anguish and bewilderment. In the face of human suffering, some have chosen to deny God's existence and God's love because they simply cannot imagine a God who would allow pain and misery in this world. Some others believe that God does exist, but then they want nothing to do with this God because they do not think that God is capable of doing any good. Still others cling firmly to a belief in an all-wise, all-powerful, and all-loving God who somehow uses evil for good. Yet, dear friends, living in a culture which dictates to us that most problems under the sun have instant solutions, I believe it is foolish, even dangerous, to pretend that we have complete answers to the question of evil and suffering in this world. The answers, if we have, seem so elusive, hidden, and often out of reach. Therefore, we may end up being frustrated, bitter, and even cynical about the world and of our faith and about and of God. So God is a pa passive spectator in the face of evil. Would you agree or not? In the Old Testament, we see, dear friends, numerous instances where God gets involved in the suffering of God's people. In their struggle for freedom from Pharaoh in the land of Egypt, and in their long march to the promised land, God, you see, not only intervenes in their struggles in the midst of their pain, but also becomes one with them in their pain and anguish. We all agree that no good and innocent purple deserves to suffer. How then can we explain what happened to Jesus? He experienced physical pain, mental anguish, false judgment of justice, and betrayal of true friendship. And Jesus was innocent. Could Jesus have avoided the cross of pain and suffering? I believe Jesus could have avoided the cross and the pain. But yet, what does he do? He takes up the cross upon himself knowingly and willingly. So, where was God, we might ask, when Jesus faced his darkest hour? The answer is God was right there with Jesus becoming an insider to his pain and anguish and being one with him on the cross. The cross is not a proof of God's love, but a consequence of God's love and of the wounds that all human beings bear. The question again is, did God's love for us require the cross? But in the end, love does not demand the cross, dear friends. But what love does is, in the life of Jesus, love 
ends up on the cross. This is what happens to self-forgetful love. This is what continues to happen. Our God's specialty does not lie in removing pain and human suffering every once in a while, but entering into it all of the time. God suffers with all those who suffer while embracing their brokenness and their pain. The well-known rabbi Harold Kushner, commenting on the tsunami that killed scores of people in Japan in 2011, said, I quote, Where is God in Japan today? God is in the courage of people to carry on their lives after tragedy and the resilience of those who, whose lives have been destroyed, families swept away, homes lost, but resolving to rebuild their lives. God is in the generosity of people all over the world to reach out and help strangers who live far from them to contribute aid and to pray for them. End of quote. We, dear friends, have seen the same in this past year with COVID-19. How many people from all walks of life, especially healthcare workers and those in, in front lines and the first responders, and everyday ordinary people and many others have been a source of healing and strength and comfort in the face of untold pain and suffering. They have been a source of hope that God in his son Jesus shares with all of us. As disciples of Christ, dear friends, each one of us has been called to bring this hope and healing to our world, especially in these challenging times. Cardinal Supic is once again inviting us this year to partner with the Archdiocese of Chicago in their 2021 Annual Catholic Appeal. The Annual Catholic Appeal, as you probably know, supports the faith formation of people, Catholic schools and religious education programs and Catholic relief services around the world, while supporting a variety of ministries in the archdiocese. The goal, the financial goal that's been given to our Ascension Parish for 2021 is $84,849. As in the past, when the contributions exceed the goal, Ascension will receive a rebate from the donated funds. Dear friends, I want to take this opportunity to thank you very sincerely for your past very successful annual Catholic appeals. And while thanking you for your generosity in the past, I hope as a parish once again, we all can meet our goal given to us this year, especially in these challenging times for all of us. And finally, I have some very good news for you. Please join me in congratulating our Ascension School and religious education students who received the Sacrament of Confirmation on February 6th. Filled with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 
We pray that they may always be witnesses to God's love, God's hope, and God's joy. May God continue to watch over these young people and their families. God bless you all.